Question, what happens when a group of people think outside of themselves, their own needs, their own comforts, even their own wants, and they sacrifice that on behalf of another group of people? What happens? The world is changed. God's kingdom comes. What you just saw there was a journey, a six-year journey of ups and downs, of struggles, of triumphs, and a bunch of stuff in between, of men and women who gave up their vacation time, who gave up their own money, who took the money that was given by you and me from this church over there to see an entire village transformed. That's what happens when the church acts like the church. That's what happens when we say, you know what, this isn't about us coming in this room and high-fiving each other because we get to go to heaven when we die. This is about us getting in the room and collectively sacrificing and being obedient to the call of the good news of Jesus Christ, getting out of our comfort zone and going to places that God says, I have chosen this group for you to serve. I want you to help build them up and then I want you to let them go, do what you have done for them for someone else. Brentwood Church, I am so proud to be a part of a church that has a generosity culture. I am so proud that we together go to places that God calls us to go. And we get to do this again. And we're gonna do this again. God has already, as you watch that 10 minute story that took six years to make, he's already stirring in some of you. When you were watching that, you're saying, I wanna be a part of that. I, 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 that's gonna be uncomfortable and I'm gonna to have to raise money and I'm gonna to have to go. And, and, and you know what that is? That is something that we all experience in the 42 years that I have been alive. I have never grown emotionally, spiritually, physically without pain and struggle preceding it. I have never grown emotionally, spiritually, and physically without pain and struggle and sacrifice preceding it. And that's what we want to introduce to people here at Brentwood Church. We want to say, look, you want to grow. You want to grow spiritually. You want to grow emotionally. You want to grow in these ways? Listen, you've got to take a step into the pain. You've got to take a step into the sacrifice. You've got to take a step into what is uncomfortable. Because on the other side of that is the next level of growth, is the next level of seeing God move in your life. And I believe that some of you are being called to this next work. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna make it as simple as possible. We have a slide. It's got all the information that you need. We are going to a new village to do exactly what we did in the Puguini village. If God has been stirring in your heart and today that was articulated to you through that story, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to our next step nook today on your way out and just say, what do I do next with this trip? and they will give you all the information. You can go to brentwoodchurch.org slash global, and you can sign up for the interest meeting, which is next week. You will be put on a information list where they will begin to, the trip organizers will begin to communicate with you. You'll get all the things that you need to do this. If for some reason you're not called to do that, and, and, and a lot of us won't be, you can know that your continued sacrificial giving at this church is going to fuel kingdom come, world change around this world. And let me, let me just say this. If you're a person who is just hesitant about giving to this church, is maybe a little cynical, maybe a little mistrusting, or maybe just you, you, you just have never been taught that, that collective sacrifice and collective obedience does things like that. I wanna encourage you today to start giving and see what would happen if you gave to what God is doing in this church. What we saw at the very end there though was baptism. And that was mind blowing to me. I never 
don't get stirred up in my heart. I know that was a double negative, English teachers. I, I, I never, I don't even know how to say it. I just get stirred up when I see people go all in and go all out in baptism. And what you saw there was that village taking ownership of the New Testament church. I can't wait to hear the stories that are gonna come out of that. I think some of you though need to get baptized. I think it's your time. I think maybe years ago or weeks ago or whatever, you took the step to believe and follow Jesus, but you have not taken that next step to go all in and to go all out in baptism and to say, I belong to Jesus and I want the world to know it. And so what I wanna do is I wanna invite you today, right now, you can go to the Brentwood app, to the sign up block and you can sign up for baptism. Easter Sunday is going to be a baptism celebration, one that you will never forget. And we want you to be a part of it. And we want your family and your friends to come and see you get baptized. Many of them probably don't believe and follow Jesus and they're gonna come hear your story. And so you know what to do right now if that is you. Let's stand up. I want you to high five. I want you to handshake. I want you to hug. Tell some people around you, I'm ready for real love. Yeah. Spread the love. Spread the love. I'm ready for real love. I know that was a little uncomfortable for you. Like, what am I supposed to mean by that? What does that mean? Uh, today, we jump into part two of a series that I believe is so critical for our day and age. And that is, what is real love? Like, there are times where we see it. We, we see it in a relationship. We see it in a group of people. And we, we step back sometimes as a third party and we observe it and we go, man, there's something about that group of people or there's something about that couple or there's something about that relationship that I just long for or that I see glimpses of that. That's real love. Like we know the real deal when we see it. We also know when it's not real. We also know when it's a manipulation. We also know when it's a, a dressed up fake version of the real thing. We, we, we're in a relationship with somebody and they say love and we say love, but we use the word love, but we know it's just a cheap imitation. Why is it? Because God has put it in our DNA to know the real thing from the not real thing. And yet so often we find ourselves going after what is not real. This series is about saying, okay, what are some of the fundamental elements of real love according to what the scripture teaches us? Last week, we realized that commitment is the cornerstone of real love it is saying to a person or a group of people, look, we're gonna go through some ups and downs and we're gonna go through some triumphs and some tragedies and we're gonna go through some struggles and some victories and all of those things in between. There are gonna be times where I like you and there are gonna be times where I don't like you, but I am committed to you. I'm committed to you. Even if you go off and you do something stupid in your life, I may not follow you into those shenanigans. I may not enable you in that but I am here with arms open, ready when you return from your crazy. I'm committed to you. And I'm gonna tell you something. You cannot have real love if you are not committed to that relationship. That's just it. Today though, we're gonna talk about another element of real love. Write this down. Real love requires sacrifice. Oh, there it is. Sacrifice, what is sacrifice? It is to give up something of value to someone that we value. Let me say that again. It is to give up something of value. Like, I, I want this. I don't even wanna give this up. It is valuable to me. It is my time. It is my energy. It is my resources. It is my pride. It is my apology. It is my seeking reconciliation. I am going to give this thing of value to someone that I value. And in that exchange, 
something happens. We experience the elements of real love. Last night, my family was at the Cavalier downtown over by Randolph College. Best fries, best ranch in town. You can tweet that. We order some fries for the table. And then the waiter comes back and says, okay, are you ready to take your orders? And we all order some hamburgers, except for my son, Chase. He orders another thing of fries. He says, I just want this as my meal. Okay. So we get through the fries and I'm halfway through my burger and I'm thinking, I want some more fries. And I look over at my son Chase and he is about half done with his fries. And I'm spotting his fries. And I'm thinking, I want those fries. I need to wash down this animal fat with some fries. He looks over at me and he says, Dad, you want my fries? And I said, well, you know, I mean, if you you don't want them. Oh, I want them. But I'm going to give them to you. And he slid the fries over and I said, you're my favorite child. (laughs) You've always been my favorite child. Sometimes we overcomplicate sacrifice. Sometimes we overcomplicate what giving up something of value to someone we value is. What we're gonna see today is that real love requires that. It requires us saying, I am going to give up something that I value because I value you. And that could be time, that could be energy, that could be resources and so on. And yet we have a hard time with this. Our relationships are broken because we want what we're unwilling to give. And here's what I mean by that. We want the people in our lives to sacrifice for us. We want our spouses, we want our children, we want our loved ones, we want our coworkers, we want the people that we are in these love relationships with, we want them to come to us and sacrifice things of value because they value us. And yet it is so hard for us to naturally do that ourselves. There are two things that we want from people. We want them, number one, to initiate sacrifice. We want them to take the first step. Oh, I'm willing to give up something of value, but I want you to go first. And what we're gonna see today is that we miss it We miss real love in wanting other people to initiate the first step of sacrifice. Now, there's a whole other group of people here today, and and I love this group of people, but you got to know who you are, and that is you have a natural tendency to want to help people and to serve people. It's your wiring. You are the kind of person that says, yeah, I'll help you move. Yeah, I'll take you to the airport at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I'll come over and, and help you clean up your house. There is something in you that drives you to be needed. And so you are willing to sacrifice your time, your energy, and resources, but it's for reciprocation. You say to that person subconsciously, I expect you to reciprocate what I am giving to you equally or at a greater value. Oh, I'm gonna come help you because I wanna be needed, but if you don't reciprocate, then I get bitter. Mm Mm-hmm, that might be where you are today. You have no problem sacrificing, but your motivation is out of something different. So whether you are a person who wants people to initiate or reciprocate, we are going to see that both of those things miss the heart of real love. I'll sacrifice if you start. I'll sacrifice, but you need to reciprocate. What's going on there? Turn with me to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. Sacrifice is one of the elements 
of real love. I wanna talk to the single ladies again. Single ladies, let's have a conversation. If he will not pay the tab, you need to call a cab. (laughs) Yes. If he will not get the check, you need to get the heck out of there. He is telling you something, that he is just a, a baby boy in a man's body. And you don't have time to teach him lessons that his mama's still trying to teach him because he probably lives in her basement. <laughs> All right, there you go, that's free. Philippians chapter two, the apostle Paul is trying to get this church to understand what we're talking about. And he uses this language of sacrifice And it's exactly what we are talking about today. It is just as relevant to us today in this time, in this age, in this room, as it was 2,000 years ago in Philippi. He says this, he asks a question, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? It's a rhetorical question, of course there is. Any comfort from his love? Of course there is, or we wouldn't be here. Any fellowship together in spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? It's a loaded question because he's describing the kind of relationship that we are to have. He says, then, if that is all true, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. What does he say? He says, look, if you really do believe this stuff, If you really do believe that Jesus Christ came and lived and died and that he was the son of God, that his death on a cross and his resurrection is your resurrection. It is your invitation into the kingdom of God now and for all of eternity. If you believe this stuff, then let it affect the way you treat each other. Let it affect the way you love each other. Let there be unity among each other. Let there be wholehearted with each other, like go all in with this. This is the kind of relationship that we are attracted to. We, we want to be around people who speak to us in a way that is loving, that serve us in a way that is loving. All of us are sitting here going, yeah, I'm all in with this. And yet we still say, but they have to initiate it first. Oh, I'm willing to give, I'm willing to sacrifice, I'm willing to give up something of value, but I don't want to lead the way, why? Because I'm afraid I'll be taken advantage of. I'm afraid that they won't reciprocate. I'm afraid, and you fill in the blank. You know this, husbands and wives, You know that you want to give up your pride and go apologize for how you made this thing really, really difficult. But you want her to initiate the first apology. You want him to lead the way in this. And what Paul is saying is, I'm getting ready to give you the elements of real love. Verse three, don't be selfish. We can all go home. Don't be selfish. In fact, I want you to say that to the people beside you. Just go ahead. Just, just go ahead. Just, hey, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. Turn, turn around. Don't be selfish. Just, it, it's that simple. Just don't be selfish. But guess what? As you're saying that to someone, somebody's saying it to you right? Don't be selfish. What does that mean? It means don't be obsessed with yourself. Your own needs, your own wants, your own desires. Don't wake up every day and say, how can I manipulate the situation? How can I get from these people? How can I get from this situation so that it all comes back to me being comforted? that I get the attention. So what Paul says is, look, if you wanna understand this, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others. 
Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. What is he saying? If you want to understand real love, we take the first step in sacrificial love. You take the first step. If you really wanna get this, if you really wanna understand this, don't wait for the people around you to sacrifice first so that you will in turn reciprocate. No, what Paul is saying is he's saying, look, if you really want to understand this kind of relationship, you've got to be willing to take the first step in sacrificial love. Here is my time, here is my energy, here are my resources, here is my pride, I lay it all out. Here is, you fill in the blank, something that is valuable to you that you would give to some relationship that you value. You take the first step. Okay, yeah, I'm willing to do that. that that's, that's cool. But I want some reciprocation. Hold up. Philippians 2, verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Awesome, yes, because he came and he sacrificed his life on a cross and at the very end of it, he said, hey, you better give me mine. Isn't that what he said to the world that God so loved? I will lay it on the line, but you better pay me back. You better go to church. You better get religion. You better dress up. You better clean up. You better moralize yourself. Because if I'm willing to hang on this cross for you, you better be willing to pay me back for the price that I've paid for you. Is that what Jesus says? Is that what he demonstrates? I think sometimes we really do believe that. that we, we have it in our heads that, that God is like us in our natural form. Verse six. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He gave up something of value. He took the humble position as a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's what he did. And, and Paul says, look, I want you to look at what Jesus did. If you really want to understand real love, then you look at the ultimate model of real love. And that is that Jesus humbled himself, made himself a slave, became a human being. Why? He was willing to give up something of value for someone he valued. Who is that? You and me and the world that God so loves. He values you. I don't think that some of you believe that. You say, well, you don't know my story. I can't earn this love. In fact, I've done enough stupid, crazy things in my life that there's no way I can even catch up. I cannot reciprocate. Because you believe that real love is about someone else initiating and you reciprocating. And what Paul says is, hold up. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, highest honor, and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue declares that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What does he say? Jesus was not in the sacrifice. He did not initiate the sacrifice. He did not initiate the love so that we could reciprocate. In fact, he knew that we could never reciprocate. He knew that we could never pay back what God had given us through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. 
There was no way that you and I could be good enough and smart enough and religious enough and spiritual enough to say, okay, I will pay you back for what you've done for me. So what was in it for Jesus? It's the same thing that's in it for you and me. And that's the question I think some of you have been asking the whole time. Okay, I'll take the first step. I'll initiate the first step of sacrificial love. I'll walk across the room. I'll give up something of value. But what's in it for me if it's not reciprocation from that other person? Because I've got to be paid back for what I'm about to do for this person. And what Jesus shows us is what was in it for Jesus was not our reciprocation. What was in it for Jesus was the heavenly father. Oh, some of you missed that. What is in it for you to initiate sacrificial love in the relationships in your life? Let me tell you what it is. It's what you're looking for. It's what you came here for. It's what you listen to sermons and sing songs and read the Bible for. It's what, where you, why you go from here to there because you want to know God and you want him to show you his will and you want him to express his love in a way that you tangibly feel his presence all over your life. And what Jesus says, here's what's in it for you on sacrificial love. Not reciprocation from all these people in your life. That should never be your motivation to give up something of value to people that you value. Your motivation is you get the heart of the Father. You experience God's power in your life. I don't know about you, but I would not give up a perfectly beautiful Sunday morning to come learn about how I can be good enough and smart enough and religious enough and take on more change and, and more shame and more blame to pay God back. He says, you can't pay me back. Here's all I want you to get when you imitate my son, me, me. I want you to get me. I want you to know me. I want you to feel my presence. I want you to host my presence. I want when you walk into the room, people say, what just happened? It's almost like the presence of God just showed up in this place. How in the world does that take place? Not because you went to another Bible study, but because you took the position of a servant. You took the position of saying, hey, I am going to elevate your value above my own values. I'm going to elevate your need above what I think I need and I want. And when you and I do that and we exchange that without wanting reciprocation, without even expecting reciprocation, what Jesus shows us is that we get the heart of the Father. That's what I want, and I believe that's what a lot of you want. Somebody was about to clap. It's okay, you can do it. You can do it. Not for me, not for me. I don't need it, but I know this, God deserves it. He does. He deserves it. He deserves our praise. He deserves us looking to the person beside, you know, hey, look, I, I'm, I know that the only threat in the Western world, I don't have to worry about bears and lions and tigers. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about if I'm going to get eat. I, 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 don't, I don't have to worry if I can eat. My biggest threat in the Western world is what are the neighbors going to think? What are people going to think? If I start praising the Lord, what are people going to think if I start getting really serious about acting like Jesus? They might think I'm weird. Honey, they may think we're Christians. I know, I get it. I get it. But you know what happens? when we get over that and we stop worrying about what other people are thinking and feeling about us responding to God in obedience, we get the heart of the Father. 
we get the presence of the Father. In fact, look what he says in Ephesians chapter five. Paul says this, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Imitate your father. Why? Because you're his children. You're his children. I love it when I see my children imitating the positive things about me. Hey, I'm not perfect like our heavenly father, but when I see my kids sacrificing for each other and giving to each other without the expectation of reciprocation, initiating the first steps in their life. I'm telling you what, man, as a father, it warms my heart. It blows my mind when I see them do that. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, look, I want you to do for each other what I have done for you. I initiated the first move. I didn't wait for you to believe enough. I didn't wait for you to get your life together enough. I didn't wait for you to be enough because you never could be on your own. What I did was I initiated my love for you, not expecting any reciprocation because you can't. What I'd rather you do is have my heart and express it to the world that I love. And, and, and that's what we just saw in that 10 minute video, right? Well, what happens when a group of people really get serious about this? What happens when a church actually thinks outside of itself and, and our own needs and our own wants, our own comforts and our own desires? We get the heart of the Father. Verse two, Ephesians five, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. What is it? What is it when we live a life with love following the example of Christ? It is a pleasing aroma to God. You know what God says when we take the first step to give up something of value, time, energy, resources, you fill in the blank, pride, whatever, you know what, I give that up, I give that up. The fear of man, I give that up because I value you. You, you know what Paul says? He says, that smells good to God. It's like him walking into the house and he smells the aroma of freshly baked bread. When you and I take on that heart and we live that kind of life in our marriages, as parents, as coworkers, as neighbors, as family members, it is a sweet aroma to God. I was on the phone with one of our leaders here this morning. He is away taking care of his father who was just put in hospice in his home. And so he's there and he's, he's taking care of his family. He's taking care of his mom and dad and in this moment. And I called him this morning and I said, you know, you know, how's it going? He says, you know, you know, there's mixed emotions. You know, I know, I know that my, my father is, is settled on, on, and he's peace, he's at peace with God. He said, in fact, just last night, my mother, and he described his mother, his mother is in the early stages of dementia, doesn't quite get everything that's going on. She comes in and out of understanding this. She kept coming into his room while he was trying to sleep to comfort him, to talk to him, to engage with him. And this son said that he kept trying to get his mom out of the room so that his dad could sleep and be at peace. And so he went in and he said to his father, he says, dad, I just want you to know what we're trying to do. You know, mom, she kind of knows what's going on, but she doesn't know what's going on. And, and I know she keeps coming in here and she keeps wanting to, to be with you and talk with you. And I know you're trying to sleep. And he, and he stopped his son and he says, if that is important to her, you let her come in here. And he literally said this to me on the phone. This was an hour and a half ago. He says, you know what? That's real love. 
It's funny how we know that, isn't it? Yeah, you can clap for that. You can clap for that. That's real love. That's real love. You know what? It's, I, I may be in the last minutes, last hours of my life, but if she wants to come in here and she wants to get that last little bit with me, then let her come in here. Can you imagine living an entire marriage and that is the culmination of it? Man, that changes the world, man. You, t- you talk about inspiring someone to get outside of themselves and to get over themselves and to say, you know what? I'm gonna initiate the first steps of sacrificial love in my relationships. I'm not gonna accept reciprocation because God doesn't expect it from me. You know what he wants? He wants me to know his heart and he wants me to live in it. And he promises me every time I act like him in that, that he gives me a little bit more of his power, a little bit more of his presence, a little bit more understanding of who he is. Can you imagine that group of people walking around in this town? That would change the world. Can you imagine that group of people flying over to Africa and India, to parts of South America and saying, here's my hard earned money. Here's my hard earned vacation. I'm gonna give that up. You can't give anything to me. I just wanna know more of the Father. And I know that when I initiate sacrificial love, when I initiate self-sacrifice, when I do that and I don't expect anything in return, then I get the heart of the Father. That's what I want. That's what I wanna be a part of. That's what I want to die and be in the arms of God. That's what changes the world. Brentwood Church. You don't need another sermon. You don't need another song. You don't need another church service. What you need and what I need is to get over myself and to walk obediently into real love that God has given me through his one and only son, Jesus Christ, and his spirit in me. And when we activate that in the world, it changes the world. Would you, yeah, come on. Would you join each other in that? Because that's real love. Sacrifice is the antidote to selfishness. And that brings us to how do we we land this? Like, okay, so Pastor John, I get that. Initiate without reciprocation. Imitate God. What, 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 where do I, like, I'm wrestling with some other things. And here's what I want you to do. Let the Holy Spirit transform your selfishness into selflessness. Let the Holy Spirit do that. And, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you. I have to do this daily, every single day. And, and you know, I, the, the, the most potent relationship that I have to do this in is my marriage. Because th- this is a person that I don't, I don't pretend in front of, I don't perform in front of. I'm, I'm at my rawest and at my most selfish. And every day I have to say, Holy Spirit, would you transform my selfishness into selflessness? And you know what? It's not these epic moments. It's, it's raining outside and my wife pulls up and she's got groceries in the back seat of the car. And it's me walking out there barefooted and getting the groceries. It's me saying, you know what? You, you stay in bed. I know you're tired. I'm, I'm gonna take the kids where they need to go. Hey, hey, you know what? I know you, I know you had a stressful day. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make dinner tonight and I'm, I'm gonna clean it all up. It, it's that, it's like, it, it's these little moments. It's, you know what? If that's important to her to come in here, to be with me in my dying moments and I don't sleep, let her come in. Let her come in. You know what that is? It's just, it's just a sweet aroma to God. And he goes, you're my child. Man, you, you are my child. 
this week and the seasons to come, look for opportunities to show real sacrificial love. Look for opportunities. That moment that you sense yourself going, that's not comfortable for me. I don't feel like doing that. I don't want to give up this thing of value, whether it's your time, your energy, your resource. That is a cue, that is a clue that you might be in a moment to initiate sacrificial love. It's your flesh fighting it. It's your natural desire to stay comfortable and stay lazy. It, and you know what? That can be a clue for you. It can be a cue for you. You know what? I don't feel like helping this person. Maybe I'm supposed to help this person. Today though, I think some of you are ready to experience the love that God has for you that's eternal. And so I'm gonna ask everyone just to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. I think there are some of you here today and you are ready to stop running from God. You are ready to stop resisting his love for you. You know for the first time in your life so vividly and so clearly that this has never been about religion. This has never been about you believing enough. This is about you just opening your clenched fists and surrendering to a God who loves you so much that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price of sin, your sin, my sin, all humankind's sin, to set in motion the destruction of evil and to defeat death once for all. And you know today that it is your time to step into that. And if that's you, I'm just gonna ask you right now to declare what is already in your heart and mind in a simple prayer. And there's nothing magical about these words. It's just, it's just a conversation that you are having with your heavenly father. And you just say something to this effect, heavenly father, right now, I believe that you are God and that you love me. And right now, I receive your eternal love for me. I receive your forgiveness for me that was given me by your son, Jesus Christ's death on a cross. Nothing that I can do, nothing that I am able to do, but what you have done for me. And today, I accept your sacrificial love for me and let your forgiveness make me new. You just thank him for that right now. You just say, thank you, God, for rescuing me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for redeeming me. And in this moment, you let the Holy Spirit of God wash all over you. That sense of power that you feel, that sense of clarity that you feel, that is the Holy Spirit of God in you right now. And that spirit is your guide that spirit is your reminder. That spirit is in you as a down payment for your eternity with God. You are now a child of God. If that is you today with every eye still closed, I want you just right now so that our care and response team can identify you and give you a gift and some next steps. I want you just to boldly raise your hand right now. Just boldly raise your hand right here in this moment. Just raise your hand. Don't fear man. Don't fear what's going on around you. You have just made the most important decision of your life. You just boldly. If you're watching online at home, just raise your hand. If you're up in the upstairs venue, just raise your hand as a declaration. Today, for the first time, I believed and followed Jesus and I am a child of God. You can declare that right now. I'm gonna have a stand right now. If today you prayed that prayer, if you declared that during our time of singing, during our time of worship through song and response, I want you to walk out of where you are. You can come down front here. We have a gift for you. We have resources for you. Also, you can go to the very back. There's a sign back there that says care room. And you can say today, 
Today, I took the step to believe and follow Jesus. And we wanna celebrate that with you. And we wanna give you the resources that you need. I think though, that some of you today, you have believed and followed Jesus for seasons, maybe even decades. But somewhere along the line, you have lost sight of real love and sacrificial love. And today, you need this church to come around you and pray. Pray that your heart will warm again. Pray that the cynicism will, will, will die, that the chains of, uh, of wanting reciprocation and, and the bitterness that you have felt for so many years of serving people and serving a family and serving a spouse that has never met your expectations of reciprocation. And you know that your heart is bitter. You know that your heart is dark. If that's you today, you can come down here and you can just say, I need God to warm my heart again to how he loves me so that I can love people that way. It may be what is destroying your marriage right now. It may be what is coming between you and a friendship that is estranged or a sibling that you haven't talked to for years. You gave and you gave and you gave and they never gave in return because you lost sight of how God loves you. And if that's you today, you can, be, you can be free of that bitterness. You can be free of that darkness. It was never about you. It was about God showing you his heart and giving you his presence because you kept loving, you kept giving, you kept serving. That is reward enough. I do not need the reciprocation of flawed human beings, but I need the power and the presence of my heavenly father. And I believe you do too. Let's live that way. Let's sing this song as a declaration of who God is. As always, our response stations are open for communion, for intercessory prayer. If you need prayer today, come be obedient to that. And then let's go change this world, Brentwood Church.